The Innovation Show exists to bring you content that you may not hear elsewhere so you can make better decisions, whether that be in your personal life or in your organization. And it's thanks to our sponsor, Zai Boli, transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded products and services, empowering businesses to manage multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease. You can check out Zai at hellozai.com. Let's get into today's episode. Today's book is a must read for business leaders, CEOs, regulators, fintech entrepreneurs, wealth managers, behavioral finance researchers and professionals working at financial technology companies. It offers an accessible grasp of the rapidly evolving outcome economy and a view about the future of the industry. Let me share a little excerpt to wet your whistle and get you prepared for today's episode. Financial services are experiencing a near collapse of their traditional value chain, which is cornering the industry into unsustainable business models looking for hyperscale. This often conflicts with the size of the jurisdictions in which they operate, the constraints imposed by regulations, and the low elasticity of demand and persistently low interest rate environments. Technology has been largely seen as an opportunity to march ahead of the progressive evaporation of revenues. Yet, our guest asks, is this sustainable? It is a pleasure to welcome the man who penned those words and so many other illuminating ones besides that, the author of Banks and Fintech on Platform Economies. It is a great pleasure to welcome Paolo Cerrone. Thanks, Aidan. I'm happy to be here with your audience. It's great to have you, man. I was telling you off air, I got so much from this book. You know, when you you think you know something, you're kind of going, yeah, I got that. And then you read your book and you go, now I absolutely got it. I learned so, so much from it. And we have limited time together. So I want to dive right in. I thought we'd start with where you talk about how the whole business architecture of the world has been upended in the shift to the fourth industrial revolution, which you say is essentially a platform revolution. And I'll take a quote here to tee you up and please bring this whichever way you like you say, there is a key difference between the third and the fourth revolutions that sets the latter apart. Essentially, traditional businesses are being progressively transformed inside out in a significant shift of business focus from outputs to outcomes. In addition, exponential technologies are putting platform economics on steroids to excel on outcome economies using all means to make the fourth industrial revolution a platform revolution. Currently, the most valuable firms on the planet are all platforms. What a way to start into the book. And please, Paolo, bring this whichever way you like. Thanks. That's effectively the opening, uh, one of the opening messages, um, which is uh, to explain why the platform economies, uh, the ecosystem platform economies uh, are becoming so important and are the realization of uh, the value of fintech innovation. But uh, before delving into into the the platform discussion, I think that uh, you mentioned something equally important at the very beginning. Uh, You basically said that uh, there is a problem in the generation of value of current business models uh, of our industry that unfortunately, without recognizing that, uh, fintech are trying to replicate. So one key element of this book is to help everybody to re-understand what value truly is, so that by re-understanding value, they can digitize value. And so they really understand the change of mindset they need to apply to their digital innovation to make sure that that new value or hidden value that they have to digitize comes to the surface. And the reason why the value is such an important topic is because we all know that uh, the average uh, of uh, the banking institutions worldwide, uh, when it comes to the price to book ratio, sits well below one. When a company has a price to book ratio below one, it means it's destroying value for shareholders. It's like uh, a distressed company. So that already indicates uh, the fact that uh, the way banks operate uh, does not conform anymore with the macroeconomic conditions uh, under which uh, they are engaging with customers. So the problem really is inside uh, 
the construct of banking and the economy more than the fact that technology is pushing them to change. So why, therefore, uh, they need to re-understand value in order to box out from this uh, constrained financial performance uh, situation? Well, for two reasons. First of all, because uh, they cannot uh, price uh, their uh, products uh, inside a very low interest rate environment, high cost of capital, fairly commoditized uh, product channels any longer. So they are invited to allow consumers uh, that sit outside uh, the industry engagement uh, or a fintech or a big tech or other platform players uh, uh, in a way that uh, they can eliminate the frictions uh, by leveraging uh, the banking solution. And that creates new value, new value in the way people are allowed to interact uh, and uh, basically share among themselves. So, so banking becomes a uh, a key capability to unlock this new value that sits outside the banking industry that all of a sudden comes to the surface. Like if you will not be able to trust and execute your payments very fast, Amazon will not exist as it exists today. But on the other side, there will always be banks. And actually, I would say there will always be bankers. When Bill Gates said that people need banking, not banks, it was partially right and so partially wrong because people still need bankers because of some things and reasons that we might discuss later on about uh, the real nature of the information asymmetry, so the pull and push motivational gap uh, that does not allow most of us uh, to self-direct themselves on a digital banking solution. Therefore, there's a hidden value in the banking relationship, uh, so bankers talking to people, that uh, has been forgotten because of uh, the facility, capability, the easiness of banks, uh, to sell in the past, especially before the financial crisis. Now, as that word is gone, by recognizing this hidden value in the relationship, bankers and fintech will understand how to invest in order to bring that value to the surface so that people, instead of paying for the products, being unaware of how they pay for the relationship, they can pay transparently for the relationship. That means they pay for accessing the banking platform. But again, if they don't recognize value, they cannot pay for that. So you see, at the end, uh, the core message of this book is to give you the means to understand what value is so that you know how to unlock new value with contextual banking platform strategies or unlock hidden value with conscious banking platform strategies. I love how you describe it in the book. I was crediting you because English is not your native tongue. It's not, and you did no. And the accent betrays me a lot. <laughs> you did such a great job. And I mean, let's share the depth of research. This goes right back to 1994. Yes, in essence, uh, because uh, I graduated uh, in uh, economics and business administration in 1994. And the professor uh, uh, that brought me to graduation uh, was teaching uh, banking and financial markets. And the core of his lectures was the asymmetry of information. And I confess, though I graduated with full marks, uh, I did not understand it. And the reason I did not understand it is because it was not explained correctly. But it took me more than 20 years of, uh, of uh, professional work and research to understand the essence of it. And um, if you like, I shared it provocatively with um, a very um, qualified audience. I was invited by BlackRock in 2019 to open some of their uh, investor conferences. And in London, I had like a few billions, uh, a few hundred billions of asset under management in front of me. And when I opened uh, the conference, I said, you know why your clients don't understand finance? So I said, because there's nothing to understand <laughs> now, very provocatively. But in essence, it means that the structure of financial markets is fundamental uncertainty. Everything that we've been doing so far, banks have been doing so far, is an attempt to, if you like, help people to make decisions facing uncertainty. The problem is that we started believing that we had enough information to forecast and to predict the future, which is not true. There is a reason why, at some point, the system collapses, uh, the market breaks, uh, people get dissatisfied, uh, they're not anti-fragile, and so on and so forth. So now, by restarting from the consistent micro-foundations of financial markets, which are biological micro-foundations, and they are biological because markets don't exist in nature, they are produced of human beings, so they're biological element, biological element. We are therefore capable to identify what really makes the information asymmetry in banking. Now, the whole essence of platforms 
is to eliminate frictions, right? So they eliminate, if you like, intermediaries, so they allow people to trade by themselves so that they are more symmetrical in trading, they don't need somebody else to intermediate, which is the biggest friction in banking, is the asymmetry of information. So the fact that some pretend to know, but they don't, and some believe they don't know, but they might know enough <laughs> to be suspicious. So by reconciling these two elements, you allow people to self-direct themselves on a digital solution in a way that the industry focuses on what really matters. So fintech innovation makes sense when it is plugged into the relationship that a banker wants to generate with a client. Or equally relevant, you basically allow that to be deployed on the most symmetrical place like payment and part of credit in a contextualized way so that people have to go through the process of buying or getting the money that they need without the huge hassle that they have to go through today for onboarding, discussing, qualifying. They can be sincerely simplify uh, much more compared to what we are experiencing today in our daily lives. So that's a key point. I just want to reinforce that the information asymmetry is an absolute key point that I took from from that first chapter as well. The other one was the difference between output outcome and output economies. So this concept is really important to understand. Paolo, I thought we'd share, if you're okay with this, the graph where you show the four different types of platforms, because this was another one of those moments where you show the information so well, and then you describe it so well. So this is the bundled value chain, digital ecosystem, platforms and value constellations, single value chains and digital value chains. Perhaps we'll share that. And maybe you'll speak to the di diagram. Would that be okay? Yes, first of all, I guess, people need to understand which is the terrain for their operations. So, so they have to have a clear understanding of the difference between platforms and ecosystems and how platform and ecosystems intersect because there is where the fourth industrial revolution will shape uh, our capability to consume not only industrial products but also the banking uh, products or financial products so you see the industry typically uh, is born uh, most of the industries are born like linear industries, linear value chains. So you have the manufacturers, you have the assemblers, you have the distributors that go to the final consumers, right? So it goes this way. So a linear value chain that works like this is not a platform because people are boxed inside a set of operations one after the other where value accrues from moving a product to the next level, right? So the price goes up because the cost uh, have been uh, added and it's not an ecosystem because uh, people cannot just change the product uh, the way they want uh, they need to interact uh, in very uh, defined ways so a bank is typically a linear value chain uh, a manufacturer of cars uh, an automotive company is typically a linear value chain but it can be that uh, um, these linear value chains uh, becomes a digital value chains so in essence, they become platforms, but they don't modify the linearity of their business construct. For example, you might decide as a bank that on one side you create products and on the other side you have to distribute those products. So the people that want to buy the products need to talk to your salespeople in order to understand if your products are fit for purpose. And maybe they are not sure so they talk to the sales people of another bank eh, in order to understand if their well manager products are good enough and so on and so forth so in the end there will be a multiplicity of institutions around the final client with a multiplicity of intermediaries eh, which are the sellers of the product that every time needs to provide information now there are companies for example all funds eh, that create the platforms so that eh, the buyers of products don't shop around they go on the platform they find the information they need eh, already organized standardized eh, with the compliance elements eh, if you like that on display and so they can consume now it is a platform because on that platform they see many intermediaries but in the end eh, is always eh, if you like a consumption that becomes very linear so you just replace the intermediary with uh, um, a, a digital interplay. Now, that generates value, but there's much more value that can be generated when you interact uh, as an ecosystem. Now, we said there's a single value chain, it's not a platform, it's not an ecosystem, and there's a digital value chain, 
is a platform, it's not an ecosystem. So before we go to the best, which is a platform and an ecosystem, we want to see the third chance. So what is uh, a, a, an industry that is uh, not a platform, but work as an ecosystem? Well, that's a bundled value chain. That means uh, when you bundle together different values coming from partners, uh, people, uh, providers that operate uh, in a nearby environment. The example would be private equity in the city of London. So the city of London is an ecosystem. There will be many people that can participate into private equity deal from lawyers to uh, chief financial officers you can hire for purpose or marketing specialist, uh, investment specialist, so on and so forth. So the private equity company bundles all of these elements of value in a bespoke way every time they make a deal. So it is an ecosystem because they source the value outside their industry perimeter but every time they have to redo the process uh, and it's not uh, like people contribute freely. So they need to sign an agreement they need to sit and discuss. So it's very cumbersome, right? It's very tedious in a sense, <laughs> it takes time. Now, when people are free to operate and contribute and they use a digital medium to do that as a venue for them to share value, that is uh, an ecosystem platform or uh, a value constellation. So that means uh, many people can equally make themselves available and participate and your consumption of that value is a click away, put it this way. So now you understand that the combinations of that value generation can be a high order of magnitude compared to those that you can find into a linear value chain. And that's why you can get a higher level of personalization or customization that may attract a variety of individuals that otherwise would not be recognizing themselves into a linear value chain. But there they can all find, if you like, their perspective and their interest. Now, the fourth industrial revolution that brings uh, platforms uh, to the center of uh, ecosystems orchestration is an ecosystem platform uh, type of uh, competitive landscape. So that is the terrain uh, where all industries uh, have uh, to fight for uh, uh, airtime. So both banks and fintech need to understand the essence of ecosystem platforms because if they can get there successfully they will have a dominant position they can box out from the existing conundrum so they can be relevant going forward in this century otherwise they might be confined and therefore uh, uh, destined to oblivion let's give an example paolo perhaps at this time one of the one of the things you talk about is okay you know what to do that's kind of the easy part the hard part is the shift in mindset, the mindset shift from a leadership team, which oftentimes means letting go of the ways you used to do things or some of the value that you used to capture in the past needs to change when you move to a platform or an open or a constellation, for example. You give a couple of examples in the book. One was the difference between share now and BMW. And the other example is the magnificent example that I loved, which was, you talked about the time Steve Jobs and Apple suddenly got it, he, he got the difference between a linear production model, and an open platform, well, uh, sometimes open, sometimes close, and knowing when to open, when to close. The process of openness uh, requires careful governance, right? So because it, it, too much openness sometimes create a negative network effects. Uh, so therefore, you need to know how to close it to curate the platform and vice versa, right? So that makes it very complex and difficult. But that's where the value is. If, if, it, if it's easy, there's no value, right? So. And let's come back to that. Because actually, the, the mental model I had there was um, like a, a DJ mixing, you know, and they're tweaking, <laughs> opening and closing different parts of the system, because that oversight and that regulation, as you say, is really, really important to make sure that you don't favor one side over the other, and you know where to close and that, where to capture value. And maybe we'll talk about Facebook as an example in a little while. But I'd love you to share maybe a couple of examples. So I'll throw some at you, Paolo, and you take whichever one you want. One was the difference between MS DOS and the telephone. The other was share now and BMW and the other that I really loved was as I mentioned there, Apple's realization of moving to a platform with iOS and iTunes. And I would start from the one of automotive, uh, because uh, it gives us, uh, if you like, uh, 
more simplicity and it's more immediate for people to to grasp uh, in the explanation of outcome versus output uh, while the one of uh, bill gates uh, versus uh, steve jobs if you like uh, so windows versus apple could be a uh, position to explain more uh, the concept of opening right so becoming a platform or not but the essence is the output uh, economy versus the outcome economy so what is the difference between these two which underscores uh, the success uh, on ecosystem platforms uh, they operate on outcome economies uh, think about a multi an automotive company like bmw bmw typically works as a linear value chain in the output economy that means at the beginning of the year they decide that they have a certain car to produce and they want to sell a certain number of cars, so quantities. So everything is focused in order to maximize the selling of individual outputs, those numbers of cars. And we'll get back to this after because it's important. But BMW can also decide to compete in the fourth industrial revolution by running a car sharing platform. So what is the difference? The difference is that uh, they may recognize that in the end, uh, what consumers want to do is to go from, at least the majority, from A to B by driving the car themselves. And so not everybody wants to have a fancy car per se. So now, in the sharing economy, what happens is that uh, the asset is less important because people don't buy the asset, so they don't buy the car. It doesn't mean that the asset disappears. Somebody still has to produce a car, and the car sharing platform needs to own the cars to make them available. But uh, the final user does not buy the car. So what the final user cares is that the experience. So the way they are engaged in going from A to B with a car sharing solution is good enough. Now, there's a fundamental element here that comes to play. So what they pay for is very different. So the monetization shifts out of the product into the experience or as we might want to say, no time to discuss into the engagement model. But there's another element that matters here. If you're not locked into buying a car that maybe you thought would be good for you, but after a couple of drives, you realize it's not your car, typically you cannot give it back, right? Or sell it immediately. So you stick with that car for a while. In case you're not happy with your car sharing experience, it's a moment for you to offboard and onboard onto a different app, right? So the, if you like, capability of consumers to move around is much higher, so there's less stickiness. So you really need to excel in consumer and client engagement with a good enough experience to keep them attached to you in terms of the consumption of your final solution. So it changes the way you position the value from the assets into the whole experience and the services around the taxes. What is about banking? Typically, banks are also linear value chains, so they operate in the output economy. The asset managers think about a large banking group, create some financial products, and maybe they source from some corporate issuing their bonds or equities. And then there would be somebody that assembles those elements, uh, checking the compliance, and maybe they are well managers. And they talk to the clients uh, using a, a network of individual advisors, uh, and then the clients uh, buy them. So you see, they decide at the beginning of the year, if this is the process, I want to sell 1 billion asset under management of a certain monetary fund. So what happens is that the focus is selling that monetary fund. And the remuneration comes from the embedded fees of those monetary funds, which are a percentage, a number of basis points of the asset under management. But what happens is that some banks are realizing that as these embedded fees are squeezed, think about passive investing in the US is a race to zero prices now, the value needs to come somewhere else, which is the engagement of the client. So if you like the relationship. So when a bank decides to operate in the outcome economy, not in the output, they decided to help their clients fulfill their goals, being individual people, families, or enterprises looking to fulfill their personal, their financial, or their business goals. Now, of course, they consume products. They will be assets, which are the individual investment funds and the individual bonds. But what happens, as in the cash sharing example, is that the key remuneration will shift out of the product into the experience, which is now called the client fee. Now, 
if you don't understand this shift uh, of uh, the nature of the fees, you don't understand uh, how to create a business model that conforms uh, with the essence of the outcome economy. And if you don't understand that, uh, you cannot win on the platform economy. So you will miss out on the fourth industrial revolution. And that requires a strong mindset shift because uh, all the incentives inside the financial institutions are uh, shaped around uh, the product silos uh, that define everything from business architectures uh, into uh, the, the hierarchies inside the organization, into the branding in front of the client. But the outcome economy requires uh, to work not vertically, but horizontally, holistically, around the client uh, and and so that is uh, the, the key essence and if you like we can also engage into a different example as a secondary example to explain exactly why that mindset shift is so complex for banks uh, looking at the way they define their incentives inside the organizations i want to really signpost this next example because this is an example everybody knows apple everybody knows apple's a trillion dollar business but it wasn't always that way it was a struggling business at one stage people forget that and it was also a linear business you mentioned there but the difference between microsoft and apple for example back then microsoft have since got their act together but i thought we'd give a real example of the mindset shift that steve jobs had to move from linear to exponential I think there's something else that happens as you move from linear value chains to ecosystem platforms, as you move from output economies towards outcome economies. And uh, an example of uh, this other facet is uh, the fate of uh, uh, Microsoft and uh, Apple. Uh, at the beginning, they were both trying, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, uh, to make it happen. And I would say that uh, Steve Jobs had uh, a much better product well-designed, uh, professionally oriented uh, everybody recognized the value of uh, the, 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 the first Macintosh. The difference, however, is that uh, while uh, Steve Jobs uh, constrained uh, the creation of value inside the Macintosh, uh, even by asking uh, the developers uh, to pay for accessing uh, the uh, technical capabilities uh, to develop uh, Macintosh compliant software, Bill Gates cared about uh, the open, uh, the openness uh, of his uh, solutions. So basically, uh, he made the Microsoft uh, as he built it for IBM compatible uh, to the IBM uh, uh, machine, and then allowed uh, all of the uh, basically uh, software providers uh, to develop uh, Microsoft compliant uh, um, software that could go on any machine, not just IBM, but also other machines. So it became de facto the standards uh, of uh, the uh, soon uh, growing uh, exponentially uh, personal computer uh, business. And so it became what it became. But Steve Jobs uh, was a smart chap, right? So I think he had the moment of uh, self reflection. And when he came back in early 2000 with uh, the creation of uh, iTunes uh, to power the iPod, uh, he changed the strategy because uh, he opened up uh, the iPod to be consumed also on uh, uh, Windows uh, 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 operating models uh, and therefore opened up uh, the possibility of uh, external parties uh, to consume elements that otherwise would have been previously confined uh, to the 100% uh, uh, Taliban-oriented uh, Apple users. And by doing so, he started uh, basically attracting uh, a humongous volume of interactions on the iTunes that became his platform for the engagement uh, of consumers, starting from the consumption of music, where he was controlling the financial checkpoints. And on top of this one, as he plugged that into the iPhone, a lot of people moved into the iPhone, right, with the new iPhone experience. but there he had uh, uh, the Apple Store, uh, which is, if you like, the evolution at this point uh, of the iTunes experience, where uh, everybody could basically develop uh, their software, right, and plug it onto the Apple Store in a way that uh, innovation was uh, coming faster. So he didn't have to create all the products by himself, right, as he tried to control in the past. So before he had a high level of control, then he reduced the level of control. He cared only about the security, if you like, the privacy, and 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 basically uh, having a good product uh, that is also important. Uh, he, he changed the, the fate of Apple to become uh, the first company in the world uh, to, to hit the trillion dollar mark on, uh, on Wall Street. So, so in essence, uh, not only banks uh, 
have to shift from output uh, the products to outcome economies understanding the consumption of the relationship model but also they need to open up uh, in a way that uh, they become uh, an open platform uh, to enrich the advisory process uh, that provides clients uh, what they need uh, so the clients find uh, what they are looking for uh, without having to be guided through so strictly inside uh, the existing pipelines of course making sure that everything is wrapped up uh, with the consistent uh, uh, regulatory uh, framework so so i feel like these two elements uh what we said before of care share uh, care sharing and, and this one of apple uh of the apple history are two elements that needs to be properly understood by bankers and fintech as well uh, if they want to excel on the uh, platform economy it's probably a good time to explain now so there's different types of platforms there so you alluded to this with apple so there's developmental platforms there's transactional platforms and then there's hybrid platforms as well and in the context of banking there's banking as a service and then there's also banking as a platform so i'd love if you'd bring those together in the light of what we just talked about from apple but most of the banks and fintech on platform economies uh, discusses uh, uh, the interactions with the final consumers right so is not much about uh, the way the individual developers uh, uh, interact uh, in order to create uh, the final product but the principles are basically the same um, and at the same time uh, it discusses uh, um, the transaction element of the platforms where consumers are buying and selling uh, with uh, with other companies uh, uh, on the system as well as uh, solutions where you have both sides of the equation so on the one side you provide uh, developers the capability to contribute uh, and on the other side you provide uh, the uh, consumers uh, the capability to interact a typical example is facebook uh, because facebook might allow consumers to transact uh, what do they transact the likes right so they share content uh, in order to be paid uh, rewarded with a like mechanism and of course that triggers a different monetization of the marketing but at the same time they opened up uh, the underlying technical platform for other complementers to develop and add uh, their uh, if you like solutions uh, or uh, um uh, individual uh, elements of value and interactions inside uh, the Facebook app. An example would be the gaming, right? Uh, that uh, was so popular, at least on the on the, on the Facebook app, uh, some uh, some years ago. That, of course, is not free of risks. Uh, so Apple and um, Facebook may not have uh, understood consistently how to open and close uh, the developing platforms as it might have allowed. Uh, um developers to access too much information to move it out of the platform that then trigger the set of uh, scandals on how some of these uh, um, uh, providers of uh, technical solutions uh, um, used or abused uh, the information about the individual user so governance is always a key element on the platform but in essence uh, there are multiple levels uh, on how you can open up uh, your uh, um, industrial definition to interact with uh, complementers and developers uh, and uh, users and consumers or providers uh, on top uh, in order to enrich uh, the value generation in front of uh, your ecosystem of reference uh, which is made of uh, providers as well as final consumers well, you've alluded there to trust and we'll come to trust in a moment but i love the way you apply all your knowledge throughout here for bankers for people working in fintechs and those who don't as well because oftentimes there's confusion in legacy organizations. They think a digital strategy or digital transformation is innovation, and they're very, very different things. And you say both linear and non-linear businesses have to address innovation and technology. Development and transaction platforms just do it differently, especially on digital. Using new technology is not necessarily the same as fostering innovation. I'd love you to explain what you mean here because the difference is absolutely essential to understand. The problem is a business problem. It's not a technological problem, okay? Um, let, let me say, first of all, uh, um, what I've been seeing. I've been traveling uh, for the last years, uh, especially before the pandemic, of course, uh, meeting hundreds or thousands of entrepreneurs, colleagues, and clients worldwide. And let's say we can divide the world into three macro areas without forgetting anyone. Say that digital technology was born in the United States of America 
the Silicon Valley 15 years ago or so. Of course, uh, China is becoming very competitive uh, in developing technology, but largely speaking, go back 15 years, uh, digital technology and the social media platforms are all born there. Europe is where a lot of regulation is born, and that's important. The European Commission wants to harmonize the capital market union at the same time, protect the final consumers and investors. The regulation is not always perfect, but it's important to make sure that uh, the system is not abused. But the real beneficiaries of uh, fintech innovation so far live in Asia Pacific, in particular in India and China, because there the business models are born. So you see, my role here has always been to understand those business models, which is a starting point, knowing that uh, what works in Guangdong, China may not work in Bavaria, Germany. See how technology now can scale a business model. So you don't start from technology, knowing that what artificial intelligence can do today could not do 10 years ago. But then keep everything inside the regulatory framework because you need to make sure you don't just disrupt, but you build sustained innovation, right? So things that matter to increase the value of the whole economic ecosystem that operates around your, uh, your company. So the business model is a starting point. Uh, technology is just a mean uh, to uh, fulfill the business model. So the problem is that uh, many bankers thought that uh, they had to learn technology. Of course they have to, it's important. But once they do that, the issue is that uh, they are still very shy in the redefinition of their business models to comply with the new macroeconomic conditions uh, they have to operate uh, into. And that is the most complex mindset shift because in essence, uh, learning what technology is about uh, can be done. You have to apply yourself. But accepting a new business model is a redefinition of the way you see yourself and the way the incentives are defined inside the organization. So we mentioned the, the, the automotive business, right? So I want to give you another example that compares automotive with banks, starting from this realization. All of the fintech entrepreneurs I met, most of them came to me explaining how they were unbundling financial services. And I think this is a mistake that many fintech entrepreneurs did. So the idea that they could break banks. The reason why they can't break banks, I always told them, is because they can't break them as they're already broken. That means banks already work in as disjoint entities. We said before that are centered around the types of products, creating a different sets of silos from KYC to anti-money laundry to client engagement to branding and so on and so forth. But the problem here is on the outcome economy, which is an ecosystem platform economy, has to rebundle bank all of these in a way that the experience and the engagement model makes sense. So even though you start very simple, you really need to have as an entrepreneur in mind the essence of bundling back, not the value of unbundling, because that's not real value. That's just a starting point. But bundling back means that you cannot bundle back into verticals. You need to operate horizontally, and that's where the problem occurs. So now I'll give you an example. A manufacturer of cars uh, operates in a way that uh, you have those that create the various components of a car, for example, the steering wheel or the Navi system. Then you have the assembler that typically is uh, the car company that puts everything on the chassis, produces the car, that is given to a car dealer. And what the car dealer does is that he personalizes the car in front of the client. So according to your level of wealth, you can upper personalize your car, you can get the tiptronic you want. And if you like, you can get the leather of the back seat done by an Italian artisan out of Florence that's magnificent, okay? But when you do this as a consumer, you don't see everything that happened before. You pay an all-in price for all of the customization elements that are given to you by the car dealer. And once you get it and pay for it, you take the car and you go from A to B in your journey. Now, what happens with banking is that uh, they don't really work this way now. Also banking as manufacturers, could be fund managers, uh, could be the bankers that create your bank account, uh, your credit card, uh, your insurance product, uh, your wealth management solutions, so on and so forth. And you need all of these products to go from A to B, but they are given to you in a disjointed way. To give you an example, so 
most of us have a bank account. We need a bank account, or maybe we don't really need a bank account. We need a fintech solution that may be equivalent. But after you have a bank account, you're not uh, final in going from A to B in your financial life, right? So you may need the payment method. So maybe you get a credit card. And again, you know, you might start talking to different division of the bank, right? So a different process you need to apply, so on and so forth. And maybe you work with a bank that is more advanced, so you get a mobile wallet. That's it. But then it is not enough. You may have some money you want to invest. So you are basically needed to buy some financial products. You talk to another division of the bank that operates with a different KYC process, uh, sets of rules and regulations and stuff. Or, or maybe not. Maybe they have a robot advisor, you go to a robot advisor. Or maybe you also need insurance for your children's education. So you talk to another division of the bank to do all of this. Now, you're never fulfilled uh, with uh, a single product uh, uh, in terms of uh, resolving your financial product, right? So you need more of that to go together. And they need to be personalized for you. The same when you buy the car, right? So you choose the level of personalization according to your wealth, then you get all together and they work out to go from A to B. But banks are pretending that you're satisfied by buying a car without the steering wheel because they give you the bank account and they don't think that then tomorrow you might also need an investment product. So it's like a disjoint mechanism. Now, working horizontally instead means that all of these individual products and opportunities are in front of the client, but what the client pays for is an all-in price to access the possibility of getting these solutions on board so that they can make the next step in their journey to go from A to B. Clearly, it's more difficult here. I stretch a bit the concept because um, these uh, needs don't happen at the same time in many cases. So they happen through time. But that's why the engagement model is so important for the bank. So you need to pay to get into the engagement model where you basically um, start uh, um, providing uh, the opportunities as the need come through or as you can discuss with the client the opportunity basically to identify different needs that uh, they might not have seen but would be good for for their financial life or for the success of uh, their enterprise now this means that you're not paying the individual bankers uh, to be at the top of the individual product lines you're paying the relationship managers uh, or the platform access that goes and shops around the individual products uh, to basically grade the access according to the wealth and the need of the individual client. That change of monetization is a change of incentives. So it's a change of careers that makes it very difficult. But not doing so constrains the bank into a business model that is a set of verticals which are divided that would not enable them to be sustainable in terms of economic sustainability, looking at the fourth industrial revolution, the high level of uncertainty in the macroeconomic conditions, so on and so forth. Changing those incentives instead allows uh, banks to redefine themselves as platforms and learn how to succeed with banking as a service or banking uh, as a platform type of architectures uh, towards contextual banking or conscious banking platform strategies. It is such a big problem that isn't a parallel that change of incentives. And it goes to any industry. I, I served a long time in the media industry, and in digital transformation, essentially, and business model transformation. And the sales teams couldn't get their head around why you weren't trying to force a revenue stream too early, because the whole idea of let it build, let it bubble up, let it create, and then figure out where you're going to make the money. That is something that many, many legacy organizations really, really struggle with. And then they don't have the patience to let it allow and let it monitor it, etc. Which, as you say in the book, takes a totally different skill set. And then to bring this to something you talk about with your, your collaborator and the former guest on the show, Brett King, is it means a totally different skill set in a bank, for example. You need behavioral engineers, you need to know behavioral science, you need to know customer behavior, all this kind of thing becomes really important. And I'll give you a little quote here, I'd love you to expand on this, you said, the common enablers in all innovation scenarios, are the changes in the generation and perception of value. Therefore, researching how clients effectively perceive value is essential to identify the most effective techniques to digitize any industries. But this is a big problem in those industries that need digitization, 
is they don't understand this looking for value, see where it comes. And as you talk about later on the book, the value didn't come in places like Facebook early, it, it took a long time for it to generate, and then to identify where the value was. And somehow to corrupt it too. <laughs> but um, yes, so the essence of banking, that is an industry that trades uh, fundamental uncertainty is to generate trust with customers to make a decision for their financial future. Trust, however, is not easy to build, but can be easily destroyed. Now, understanding what trust really means allows you to understand where value comes from. And if you identify that, you can ignite the positive network effects uh, on your uh, ecosystem platform uh, um, ambition. So, so, so to me, that element of value is very important. And I can give you a telling example about uh, what happens if you don't identify value at the very beginning, uh, where the value really is, uh, because uh, you might destroy your uh, uh, opportunities, uh, you might trash your investments, uh, because we take too long, uh, without that understanding, or uh, you can accelerate everything uh, basically to replace all your competitors. And, and, and I do so by bringing a personal example that intersects uh, the history of uh, Amazon and Jeff Bezos. Now, I do that with uh, carefulness. Uh, all of those that have already read the book know that I clearly explain why it is not so easy to uh, move uh, an example from e-commerce uh, to banking uh, as uh, our psychology as human beings uh, works differently when we interact with the financial product problem compared to a, a consumption e-commerce problem. But this one is really telling and also Jeff Bezos was ingenious enough to understand it in his own industry. And therefore bankers, they need to know that this is even more important for them. So they need to get it right now. So the fintech entrepreneurs. Now, this starts as a personal story because uh, in the 1990s, uh, I, I said I graduated in uh, economics and business administration. I started working as uh, a quantitative risk management uh, risk manager in investment banking. I also helped my brother to build a startup that wanted to be the Amazon of Italy. I don't, don't laugh at me because we had the, the best products in the world to sell on the internet. We had Italian fashion, furniture, food, and travel. What could go wrong? We had uh, a sleek web design. It was super cool. Looked like uh, a real uh, uh, supermarket or, or shopping mall. And we had um, a innovative at the time a payment mechanism that a bank was uh, providing us with. We didn't sell anything. <laughs> Very little. <laughs> okay, didn't fly. So wouldn't say a disaster, it was an interesting experience. And, and my my brother, uh, um, if you like, um, drive for innovation was, was amazing and inspiring to me, but it didn't work. And I understood that among the many mistakes that we made, that there was one that was quintessential. When I heard uh, a few years later, an old uh, interview of Jeff Bezos, from the days when Jeff Bezos launched Amazon. Now, I'm older than you. You might not remember. At the very beginning, Amazon was primarily a place where you could buy and sell books, right? So books were the, the, the main product on Amazon. And the journalist asked Jeff Bezos, what is Amazon? So Jeff Bezos looked at him with his spirited eyes and said that Amazon is not a distribution channel of books on the internet. I did this, I frowned, and you might be doing that too. Like the question in a moment becomes, is a bank, is a fintech, a distribution channel of products um, on digital, on mobile technology? So now to explain why Amazon was not a distribution channel of books on the internet, um, Jeff Bezos continued saying that um, the publishers were sending him letters complaining that he did not understand marketing and now call him stupid. The reason is because it was allowing users to post positive and negative reviews, but the publishers were saying, just allow them to post positive reviews so we can sell more. But Bezos said they don't understand 
because they are not the publishers, my client, okay? I'm not a distribution channel of their books uh, on my internet uh, website. My clients are the users. And the problem here uh, is that uh, the users might onboard on Amazon, but as they cannot take uh, a Paolo Cironi's book in their hand, smell the glue as I usually do when, uh, and he actually picked one book from, from the shelves during the interview, they may not be really motivated to act uh, and to transact. Okay, they cannot ask somebody there nearby if they've read the book, uh, you know, the, their, their opinion, so on and so forth. So then he said that positive and negative reviews uh, are needed uh, to create the trust. So that transparency generates trust for people to make a consumption on Amazon. And basically said that as I'm not the distribution channel of books, my role is to advise the clients on which is the best book to buy. So I need to find a technical mechanism that enables me to provide that advice to resolve the motivational gap between a push industry and a pull economy where people are capable of self-directing themselves, of course. I also discussed the fact that, that, that positive and negative reviews can be abused, so there has to be a regulation in place, right? So that's always part of my, my, my thinking, uh, uh, literature, and business proposition. But that is the essence of the element. You're not a distribution channel. You're an advisory mechanism. And then he continued, uh, and then there was an Ola moment for me. He said, that, you know what? Only after I resolve the problem, I use other analytics to invite clients to do further, to do more. So now, this is what has been happening in banking that is reflected in my literature and the way I built up the Bank Innovation Quadrant. We all talked about uh, um, data-driven banking, so the possibility of uh, learning from data more about the client uh, and, and position the opportunities in front of the client. But there's one element that is way more important that precedes data-driven banking, which is data-enabling clients. So first of all, you need to enable clients uh, to be comfortable in self-directing themselves, knowing that the essence is fundamental uncertainty. So it's not about just information, it's the engagement, it's the relationship model that needs to be supported by digital technology. Only after you can use all the power of the data that uh, you have in-house, uh, outside your house, in the open banking framework, the open finance framework, in order to further enrich uh, the client experience uh, on the platform economy. But you need to recognize uh, as a banker and fintech that you cannot be configured as a distribution channel of products, but you need to become uh, a trusted uh, advisor for your client journeys. And from that comes a lot of consequences, the changes in the organization, the changes in the incentive mechanisms, the changes uh, in uh, um, the way the products themselves uh, are uh, created uh, and therefore uh, the enable shift from output to outcome economies on the ecosystem platform revolution. Well said, man. And I'm going to then build on that because we're very clearly talking about trust now. And we're going to focus on trust for a little while, Paolo. And I thought we'd shift to something you say here. So I just want to emphasize what you're saying there, because there's a little quote you say in the book, the emphasis of digital platforms should not be on digitizing products, but digitizing relationships when it comes to financial services, for example, because there's treasure in those relationships, because we're all biased. We're all oftentimes fearful going into those relationships when it comes to managing our money and there's trust in the system that is often overlooked. And that is a key point from this element of trust. But let's build on it, Paolo. Because if I'd ask the audience to think about different platforms, they might think about WhatsApp or YouTube or Facebook or LinkedIn or Snapchat, etc. Now, think about where you actually contribute to that and how trustworthy do you feel about that and Paolo mentioned this other earlier on there has been abuse of that power that comes from the data that they hold in those systems and Paolo tells us in the book access to new platforms is often free in order to lure in as many participants as possible to create network effects unfortunately it then becomes difficult to ask clients to abandon freemium models without offering something truly relevant in return, incurring the risk of deteriorating trust. Therefore, the monetization of nonlinear businesses requires lateral thinking to discover yet unknown ways to retain value 
on entire ec ecosystem dynamics. Collecting data about all user interactions is a precondition. User behavior must be analyzed, understood, and then modeled. So the process first is to find value and then to monetize it in a trustworthy and transparent way. Again, Paolo, a very difficult voyage for many, many companies, particularly legacy organizations who are used to linear thinking. So that gives us a chance uh, of uh, uh, introducing the concept of uh, contextual banking platform strategies uh, and the problem of operating those strategies in a way that you retain value to pay for your efforts. And it's a story about the misunderstanding of uh, the value generation with open banking and open finance. Because um, in essence, uh, the reason why banks are getting uh, contextualized uh, is because they have an opportunity, as Brad King uh, might teach us, uh, to eliminate friction in um, an alternative user ecosystem. So a client journey then happens outside uh, the banking definition. So what we basically do is that you allow a third party provider of services, uh, being a fintech, a big tech, or somebody else to consume your financial services capability, this is the example is payments, in order for them to eliminate the friction in user engagement to make sure that clients are more inclined to continue the journey, to consume their products, so on and so forth. Now, what happens, however, is that uh, the moment uh, you as a user consume something without the friction at the very beginning you might be very pleased because you compare to a previous experience you're like oh this is easier is uh, one click to pay right uh, and uh, you check out on amazon so let me use it but after you get used to that uh, you assume that's really free right so you may not pay for that you assume that becomes a standard which puts a problem uh, on the model that only sees open banking and open finance as a consumption model of individual API calls because they might not be capable of pricing it sufficiently at the very end because the price in front of the client will have to discount the fact that there's a race to zero prices. So that has to be considered the standard. So those platform providers at some point will be inclined to replace your open banking capability, right? By building their own uh, open banking uh, uh, um, opportunity or uh, their own, uh, you, you know, some like uh, um, uh, shopping malls are now creating uh, their banking uh, uh, charter, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So now that means that since the very beginning, uh, when you operate to make sure that the information inside uh, your core banking is available to external participants through APIs uh, on the open banking or open finance economy, the consumption through those APIs is just a starting point. Uh, but the final value will uh, soon be recognized on the whole ecosystem interplay and not uh, in the elimination of the friction at the very beginning. So that shifts very fast. So that is the reason why some banks now are really thinking to orchestrate those external ecosystems in order to be capable of uh, capturing the full value, which is an ecosystem value that comes from the interaction among the people, more than focusing on monetizing solely on the consumption of the APIs. So they already think about how to make sure that anytime soon, as that consumption is uh, basically squeezed in terms of margins because of the race to zero prices they still be they will still be profitable and retain value from their investments because they can access the value on the full ecosystem so either they orchestrated those ecosystem platforms or they sign up more logical partnership agreements with those providers to make sure that they can also participate into the platform interplay not only into the individual transactional elements those instead that they don't recognize this uh, might be constrained uh, in their capability to build a return investment and in most of the cases will be unsatisfied because they may not see if you like the, the recognition uh, in terms of uh, market consumption and uh, the willingness to pay for their consumption as much as they thought at the beginning of their uh, open banking and open finance uh, journey so that it is uh, the value 
that uh, is uh, unlocked on the ecosystem interplay, the one that we have to chase strategically in the end if we decide to embark into a contextual banking journey by building a banking as a service, opening up the APIs to the consumption of external parties, working with them in partnering uh, to basically access that value or orchestrating that ecosystem directly. And that's my suggestion to bankers and fintech that want to get down the route. There were so many more questions I had for you, Paolo. I have lists and lists of questions here. By the way, for those people watching us or listening to us, you we're only on chapter two of the book. And I actually kind of skipped the introduction because the introduction itself has so much nuggets of knowledge. It's a magnificent book to really get your head around this. If you work in a bank, if you work in fintech, either reach out to Paolo, get him to do a talk or a workshop for your team, or buy a copy of the book for your entire team. Paolo, for those people who do want to reach you, where can they find you? I'm uh, very active on social media, particularly on LinkedIn, so they can connect there. We can share uh, uh, thoughts uh, openly uh, with the broader community. They can check my work on uh, my website, thepcironi.com. Uh, all the links uh, to Amazon for uh, accessing this new resource, uh, Banks and Fintech on Platform Economies. Or uh, they can reach out through the IBM channels. Uh, I'm the global research leader of uh, IBM Institute for Business Value in banking and financial markets. And so I produce all the research in the name of IBM. So there's another opportunity to meet uh, uh, with clients uh, and with interested parties. It's been absolutely fascinating. And reading the book has been fascinating. I had, had so many light bulb moments. It's been an absolute pleasure. Author of Banks and FinTech on Platform Economies, Paolo Cerrone, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. What a magnificent but way too short episode for my liking, but it was a pleasure to have him. Hopefully we'll have him again in the future. We only got a little bit into that book, Magnificent Learnings from the author of Banks and FinTech on Platform Economies, Paolo Cerrone, all made possible by our sponsor, Zai, boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded products and services, enabling businesses to manage multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease. Check out Zai at hellozai.com. I'll see you very soon.